What a great way to start this show with a super Beatles song. Well well done, Eric Johnson. This is Jim Shaw, your guest host today. Glad to be here till 5 p.m. right here on Afternoons Live. For those of you who don't know me, longtime broadcast journalist in the Fargo-Moorhead area, first at WDAY-TV and then at KVRR-TV. I now write a column for the Fargo Forum and other newspapers throughout North Dakota and Minnesota. I've been a frequent guest host of this show and the morning show. And when Tyler asked me to guest host for today, I said yes, of course. And when he always asked, I think, okay, who do I want to bring on the show? What do I want to do with the show? And then I had, I thought, was a really good idea. Uh, and that idea was to bring on the guy who is probably the most familiar face of this radio station and ask him questions to get to know him a little better, a little probing. That person, of course, is Joel Heitkamp, longtime guy who has hosted News and Views and before that the afternoon show, operations manager here. Uh, and I, I got to uh, say congratulations. Now are named the best radio station in the Red River Valley by a vote of the people uh, in a poll conducted by Forum Communications. So, Joel, thanks so much for doing this, and welcome. Well, this one surprised me a little bit, Jim. I mean, so thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be in the number two chair, and I live in fear of what you might ask. Well, you know what surprised me? When I asked you, and I, I really didn't know which way you were going to go, but you had told me that nobody has ever asked to interview you before, and I thought, that's quite unusual, quite quite surprising for a man who is out there like you are, a man a man of your stature. And uh, I thought, well, okay, let's let let's give it a go, and I and I appreciate you doing this. So my first question, in light of how we started the show today, is why don't you like the Beatles? <laughs> <laughs> you you got to remember, I'm the youngest of seven, and so there was a lot of Beatles in my house, and, and it was basically crammed down my throat quite a bit by my older siblings so uh that and and i'm a i'm a rock and roll slash blues guy and i don't believe that the beatles heart and soul comes from the blues even though they say it i I think paul mccartney's does in his private in his solo work but i don't think it comes through with the beatles but even though it was shoved down your throat don't you think their music was pretty good i think some of it was i think i think that when you sit there and go she loves you, yeah, yeah. That's not good music. No, no, that's not that's not good music. All right, we could spend an hour <laughs> talking about this, and I I, I want to move on. We just lost I'm listeners just, with me I, faking I, I was a Beatle. I, I just uh, lost a lot of respect for you. That's all. <laughs> and I and I have a lot of respect, or at least I did before going into this interview. <laughs> all right, so let's talk about you. Seeing how you talked about growing up, uh, because here you are now. You've been into politics. You've been into current events. So when you were growing up, did the Heitkamp family talk about politics? Did you talk about current events? Yeah. I I mean, not as much as certainly what Heidi and I, when Heidi and I brought all that to it. But uh, we weren't afraid of of current events. My mother had strong, strong opinions politically. uh, And that came from her mother. It it was, uh, in those days, it was called a NPL, you know, nonpartisan league slash farmers union family. Um, So they really felt that the big guy uh, was stepping on them and that the smaller farmers didn't uh, matter as much. And, you know, that they were subject to whatever the elevator said, those type of things. And so it it came from that background. And then, of course, you remember the 70s. You remember them very well. And then a lot of passion came out from young people, not necessarily on the war, but just on the traditions of what you were expected to do, that whole you have to be like Norman Rockwell and you can't grow your hair long kind of philosophy. And, and of course, you know, I have sisters that were very much into women's rights, you know. Did you watch the news every night? Did you read the paper every day? Was there kind of – was that emphasized in your house to uh... – you know, be a good citizen by knowing what's going on in your community and what's going on around the world? Well, not only did we did we read the paper, we delivered it. So the paper was a big part of our life. Uh, the Minneapolis Star Tribune was 
the the Sunday edition was dropped off at our house, and the Sunday Fargo Forum was dropped off at our house, and we would stand on the steps of the St. Peter and Paul Church in Manador, and people would come with their coins and buy the newspaper. And so, yeah, it was a big part of our life. My dad never, ever uh, missed, you know, Walter Cronkite. I mean, that was a big part of it. Um, you know, Mark, I, I remember my dad being a very big supporter of Mark Andrews. He thought Mark Andrews was a, a really good man and a good senator. Um, you know, and of course, Quentin Burdick was like part of our family. He would he would come to our house. At oh, times. really? Yeah. Wow. Yep. So you and Heidi and your family, you, you've been Democrats. Um what made you a Democrat? Oh, I think what made me a Democrat was coming from a poor family. I really, I really think that's the biggest thing that the the Democratic Party, in in my eyes, sticks up for those that really are kind of uh, being pushed aside. If if you look at what's happened, you know, and I don't mean to to get to a, a place where we're we're having an old news and views afternoons live type conversation but if you look at what's happened over the last you know years under under 45 for example and before that 43 uh the the tax breaks that were given to the rich and there's been a huge separation between you know the working union man and woman and and the rich in this country and that's that's what drove us and me particularly i was a big supporter of the union huge supporter of the union okay Staying into politics, you were in the North Dakota Senate for 14 years. What were your greatest satisfactions of being a state senator during those 14 years? And what were your greatest disappointments? Oh, boy, Jim. Um, One of the things I'm really proud of is the fact that I pushed for and was able to achieve credits being transferred from our two-year colleges to our four-year institutions. You know, the... The two-year colleges, the the four-year institutions, NDSU and UND, uh, were complete snobs to the trade and tech schools. And I didn't like it. Uh, I didn't like the fact that these kids would have to come in, they'd go to a state college of science, for example, and then they'd have to start all over again if they transferred to UND or to NDSU. And they fought me on that like like crazy. Uh, they They talked about how they were going to, lose their accreditation and how I was wrecking higher education and really what it was about. And my whole point was you're not focusing on the student. And in the end, I was able to to push for that and get it and to get those credits to transfer. And so that was, I, I think Jim, I was the only one on the bill. And the reason I was the only one on the bill was because not because I didn't ask others. I think Republicans would have went on the bill with me because I thought I was going to lose. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, really, we ended up having to back off on some of it and and make sure that the system worked out better. That higher ed basically walked away and said, look, we've got to make this happen. Right. And, and they did. Sounds so, like a no-brainer. Okay, yeah. greatest disappointments. You must have had oh, something that became law that you didn't want to become law or something uh, or vice versa where you, you – um, push for something and it just didn't happen. But what were your greatest disappointments yeah, as a state I think senator? My greatest disappointment was we we worked so hard to to have the state understand what was happening to farmers and homeowners when it comes to property taxes. We would give property tax breaks to those individuals that, in my opinion, didn't need them mm-hmm. uh, through through Renaissance zones projects and things like that. I mean. Let's be honest, Doug Burgum's a billionaire, and he's received tons of to- property tax breaks. But if you own a, a $300,000 home in Fargo or a $200,000 home in Fargo, not only is your assessment going up, but your property taxes are going up. Uh, and so I lost on that. I didn't get the state to realize that they have a role. And And what I'm getting at is – the the state doesn't raise property taxes, but they ignore it. And so what I wanted them to do was to understand that they needed to fund K-12 education so school boards didn't raise property taxes. They needed to fund townships, uh, you know, so and counties. And then they wouldn't have to raise as many mills as what they do. And I didn't I didn't win. I, I didn't win on that one. We're talking to Joel Heitkamp. 
We have to take a break now. When we come back, I'm going to ask Joel about the transition from being a state senator to a radio talk show host right here on Afternoons Live. We are back. Jim Shaw, your guest host, right here on Afternoons Live on the mighty 790 KFGO, right up until 5 p.m. Our guest is Joel Heitkamp, host of the most listened to talk show in the upper Midwest, and he is operations manager of the most listened to radio station in the upper Midwest. So those are pretty, pretty strong credentials. Joel, in 2008, you were working for KFGO while serving as a state senator. But because of FCC rules, you had to make a choice. Be a state senator or be a radio talk show host. You chose to be a radio talk show host. Why? Uh, I think that was the next challenge in life. I loved working for Roll Water in my real job. And just, you know, I had a hand in, in hiring everybody that worked there. So I, I love the people I worked with. They were good people. Um, but we were kind of done building at that time. And I was a builder. I wasn't a maintainer the way other people on the staff were. And so it, it was kind of time to 23 years. I, I started there when I was 20, you know, so it was, it was time to try a new challenge. Well, then that went with the Senate as well. If I was going to take the job in radio uh, by FCC rules, I had to get out of politics. Right. So 14 years as a state senator, you know, th- that was probably long enough to. Okay. So that was a relatively easy decision for you. It wasn't hard yeah. to say goodbye to the state senate. It, it was, but it also wasn't it, – it wasn't hard to walk away from here if it hadn't worked or if – Things were rammed down my throat, which almost happened, mm-hmm. which which almost happened when ownership changed here. I almost pulled the pin and and went a different direction. So. Okay. You worked at KFGO for and with Ed Schultz. I mm-hmm. worked with Ed at WDAY-TV. What's your take on Ed Schultz? Oh, boy. Uh, passion. Um, it, you know, bigger than life personality. Uh, and if you didn't believe it, ask him, um, you know, he, he, he had a talent more than anyone in this business that I'll probably ever work with. Uh, he had an ability to get people riled up, to talk, to, to, you know, to call in, to take, I'm not sure, at least I would hope he didn't agree with all the positions he took on air. Um, I know that at times I don't. Uh, you know, just to get people to to bring out theirs. But he was really tough to work with. He was really tough to work with. He, How so? Uh, I, he, you know, it had to be his way. Um, he had a lot of irons in the fire. So at that time, he, uh, you know, uh, Jim Ingstead took over the radio station. He bought it. And, and he brought in a new manager, Nancy Odney, who, by the way, you know, I loved working for no problems here at all. I'm not complaining about that. But they wanted Ed Schultz in the morning. I was on in the morning. They moved me to the afternoons. And uh, Ed Schultz told me that Jim had given him the reins, that he was going to run KFGO. Well, if that was the case. Oh, and, and it wasn't. Ed Schultz said that 2007 session because they hired me in five. And I had another legislative session. He said, you're not going to that. You're You're not going. And I said, well you know, here's the thing, Ed, I gave my word to my district and the people that elected me. And I, I, there are many times I could have went a different direction, but I always upheld that. And so I'm going, he said, well, then you're out of here. And I said, then I'm out of here. And I walked out and, and, uh, I got a call from a guy named Jim Ingstead and, uh, Jim said, whoa, 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 wait a second here. Ed isn't running the place. I got an individual you haven't met yet named Nancy Odney, who you're going to find to be, you know, and and I did. I I had a good working relationship with her. And so so once I found out that Ed wasn't going to be my boss, then it settled down. Then it was like, okay, let's make this radio thing work again. I have not heard that story before. Have you told that story no. before publicly? No. Interesting. All and right. I'm, not, I'm not sure that Jim wanted me to tell that story, but it's all true. So. Well, that's what we're here for, yeah. like, to, to get some of these true stories out while, while we've got you here. There are a lot of things that happen behind the scenes with yeah. me and Ed. All right, uh, we're running up against the clock, so we'll see how far we get with this question. And if you have to continue answering after the break, so be it. 
So after all these years of being a radio talk show host, what do you love the most about this job, and what do you dislike the most? Oh, I I love the fact that I get to visit with so many people. I've always loved that. I You know, I was at the Northern Ag Expo today, and I was – saying hi to everybody I could, stopping by the booths. I mean, that's that's been – that was me long before I got into politics. Um, you know, so that's fun. The people I get to work with, everyone here at KFGO, short of Don Haney and, and Paul Jurgens, and then, you know, Jack does some part-time work now. But I've hired, you know, the, this, this team that we've put together at KFGO that's still number one, voted best, all of those things um, – you know, they're, they're, they're folks I get to work with every day, but I chose them. And I love that. I love that these these brilliant people come in. And we've had to let some go. I mean, some were bad decisions. All right, I got to cut you off because I have to break tough to take a break. When we come back, I want to hear what you dislike the most. More with Joel Heitkamp right after this. 236 right here in the mighty 790 KFGO. Jim Shaw, your guest host on Afternoons Live. Eric Johnson, your extraordinary producer. By the way, Eric, we have one more break before we have to say goodbye to our guest, Joel Heitkamp. So um, please play a Beatles song and come back <laughs> for that, just, just for Joel's sake. Just play, I think uh, I can make that happen. Right. Play our, Paul McCartney at the end. Yeah. <laughs> our guest, as I mentioned, is Joel Heitkamp, host of the most listened to radio talk show in the upper Midwest, host of the number one, or I should say operations manager of the number one radio station in the Fargo-Moorhead market. Joel, uh, when last we spoke, you were, we were talking about the good things about being a talk show host. What about the bad things? What do you dislike the most? No. Oh, well, I I dislike doing the show for one person. Um, when you when you go somewhere and that one person really dislikes you or wants to debate, even if they like you. And the next thing you know, they want a half hour of your life. And, and you're like, look, that's what I do for a living. I'm not working overtime. And then you're, you're perceived to be a jerk because you don't want to sit and talk uh, policy or politics with them for a half hour. The, the other thing that, that I should have probably said first is, is what it does to your family. Um, and, and believe me, they've gotten the benefits of it too. That, that isn't, they'd be the first to say that, but for my daughters, they can get, I'm sure criticized a lot for being Joel Heikamp's daughter, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, and for Sue, I mean, you you walk in certain areas and instantly people judge them based on me, and that isn't fair. Uh, but they do, and so, you know, I don't I don't like that. I don't think we can change it. Um, you know, the 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 whole situation with Heidi that's already hit our family big time. So, I'm sure I know you get a nasty text messages, next nasty phone calls. I'm guessing you get nasty emails. Uh, I get all of those too as a columnist, but I'm just wondering, do they bother you? Do they get to you? Well, the security door out there was put in because of me. Um, you know, we, we had, I've had threats. I've had death threats. I've had, uh, envelopes with powder in them. I've had, uh, you know, those type of things. I've had individuals, you know, that, that ended up being in other capacities that were, uh, found to be not as, you know, I shouldn't have taken it as cavalier as what I did. You know, there were individuals that were arrested for other things that had threatened me. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if you live in fear of that, you can't do the job because that's what they want you to be. They want you to be afraid, afraid to say what you think. And, and in today's world, the, the area that we live, probably 60% of the people, if if not 65, disagree with what I'm going to say, but they find it interesting to have that conversation. But there's always those that believe I'm the fault of everything that happens in their life because of it. So, you know, I've, I've been threatened. I've, you know, but th- that happened in the Senate too, Jim, that, that same thing happened in the Senate too. I'll, I'll bet it's worse as a talk show yep. host. I mean, you have a lot more people listening to you than you did in the, in yep. the Senate. I had no idea you had death threats and I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm not surprised. It, it doesn't I, happen all the I time. Because I, I know what, what I've received. Um, and uh, when I made that switch from straight news to throwing in opinions, I was stunned with the initial reaction from people. I'd never received any hate mail in my life before. Um, 
but I'm glad you have the perseverance to keep going. Well, the the people that work at the front desk uh, before that security came in, they were really put in some tough positions where, you know, th- there was one individual that was screaming and hollering, you know, you got to get him out here right now. Um, the, 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 the most recent one was in Medina. Uh, when we did the coffee with KFGO, there was this jerk in back of the room who took after me and all the ladies were shooting dice or playing cards and they clapped for him. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it riled up this, this guy that I, you know, just, it was in the cafe and then he came back and wanted me to shut off that microphone. You come talk to me right now, or you're going to get it. He never said what I was going to get, but he said I was going to get it. And then here we go. Right. So it happens. Yeah. It, it always amazes me that people get so riled up. It's just, this is America. We have freedom of speech. You you give your opinion. Every, everybody has opinions here, but it's just one guy giving his opinion. It's it's not a threat to anybody's life or your way of life, but they get riled up. Well, and then think of the other things that I was doing at that time. I was all the referees. You know, I was doing a lot of college football, Bison UND, and my crew had Joel Heikamp on it. And so it's like they got labeled. Well, there are a lot of people on my crew that disagreed with my politics, you know, and yet they were willing to put up with the screams and the hollers from the sidelines and those type of things. So, All right, switching gears a little bit. I know you have been asked to run for statewide office, but you have said no. How come you have said no to running for statewide office? Obviously, you, you bring a lot to the table. You're well-known. You have passion. Uh, people know you, and they know your sister Heidi, who was uh, an outstanding U.S. senator. Why, why uh, have you said no? Well, we're two different people with two different kinds of of styles. Obviously, mine would be much more along the line of, you know, let's go get them. You know, Heidi's is very thoughtful. Read every line of the policy. That that never was me. Mine was surround myself with people that were smarter than me and take their advice, and then me would be the bull that runs through the door. But I. I didn't want to do it, and and I know now people think I still look at it. And just recently, somebody of really good Republican prominence asked me to run, and I said, I said you don't know. Well, he did. That that individual knew because, quite frankly, he was an elected official. But it's really, really hard on your family, and you're you're walking in parades constantly you're knocking on doors constantly i did i did that to my family and for 14 years of being for the money all the time all the Begging time for money yep and and so when on a weekend in the summer everybody could be hanging out on a pontoon you're saying hey would you come to west fargo and walk in a parade please please we need to look like we have an army and everybody did that for heidi and she showed a lot of appreciation but i know what goes into it. I know what, and I'm not convinced I want to do that to my family. I'm not ruling it out, but I'm not, not convinced. All right. So there it's possible just, just from your last answer, it's possible that down the road you might run if I, if I listen to you correctly. Well, I mean, how do you know? Prob- probably not yes, uh, a better than a good 50% answer. chance. Yeah. But there, as, as, uh, Way less uh, than a 50%. Jim, as Jim Carrey said, you're saying there's a chance. You're saying there's a chance, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, to, to me, this is a Trump state now. It's a Trump state. And in fairness to those Democrats out there that run, I just respect you so immensely because you know what an uphill climb it is. That the, the attitude that some of these Trumpers have – uh, just is is vicious when it comes to my side of the aisle. And so, you know, I just, I don't know that I want to involve my family in that. All right. So let's let's pivot to the state of affairs in, in North Dakota politics now. As you know, not too long ago, the entire North Dakota congressional delegation, all Democrats, we had Democratic governors once in a while. Uh, we had uh, Democrats every now and then controlled the chamber of the legislature. Now nothing. Statewide offices all held by Republicans. Republicans dominate in the state legislature. What has happened to the Democratic Party in the state? Well, in in large part, and this is going to sound, you know, like a cover up, but we succeeded. Um, if if you take a look at the 1980s, which you were reporting then, you know what it was like to be out there and what Sarah Vogel and others were doing uh, to try to save family farms. Uh, the Democrats came in, and that was the popularity of, of uh, 
Kent Conrad when he upset Mark Andrews, and it was an upset. David Crothers once told me. I covered me, that race. Yeah, uh, David Crothers told me if that race was held again the next day, he's not convinced that Conrad would have won. Um, and, and I'm not so sure David isn't right. Uh, I think people were trying to just say to Mark, hey, this is ridiculous. The government's taken our land, and what have you done about it? And it, it wasn't necessarily Mark's fault. But, um, you know, the 80s were terrible for farmers. Mm-hmm. They looked for leadership. Uh, they found it in, in Kent, Byron, Earl. They had it already in Quentin. Uh, and so they had some strong people in Congress, and it took off. And so, you know, the Democrats were pretty popular. Sarah Vogel, Heidi Heitkamp, you know, they had elect statewide elected positions. And we won. Y- you you got federal crop insurance, right? Y- you got roads. You got bridges. You know, there, there were so many things that happened. And I consider it, it Jim, like the union in uh, Gwinner. Okay, when I was running... The union in Gwinner was being treated by Bobcat like crap. Just like they were walking up to them on a Friday and saying, you've got to work all weekend regardless if it was their niece's wedding. They didn't care. You're just lucky to have a job kind of a management. Well, when I took over in the Senate, I I was just pounding on that, pounding on that, and we won. Well, now that very same union, if you look how they voted in the last election, they didn't vote Democrat. I mean, they don't vote Democrat anymore because they have the very things that we fought to get them. And many of them now, for them, it's all about guns. It's all about gays. It's all about God in their mind as though I don't believe in God. And so, you know, they've put their focus somewhere else because many of the problems they had in life, we took care of. All right. Uh, If you can answer this question in one minute, and hopefully you can. How do you explain the rise and popularity of Donald Trump? Oh, I think he made it okay for people to be who they are. And by that, I mean some of the worst among us. I'm sorry for you Trump supporters. I don't believe you're all uh, like the person I'm about to describe. Uh, But there are many people out there that weren't active in politics that that are racist, uh, that uh, uh, think it's okay to treat women a certain way. Uh, that think it's okay to to cheat uh, and to cheat on your taxes and everything else. And he made it okay. In fact, he made it cool uh, to be that person. And so when guys used to sit around having a beer in a circle and say, yeah, so-and-so, yeah, in, in the old days, that was unacceptable. Now he made it acceptable. And so they like him for that. Well thought out answer. We got to take a break now. We'll be back to wrap it up with Joel Heitkamp right after this. How, how oh, can man. you not love this song, Joel? <laughs> Eight days a week, it's yeah. a classic. Right. Come on. Right. Come on, it's, admit it. you got to you know, like this song. I, I, you know those beautiful kids you have I've met? I bet you they fell asleep to this well when you sang it to them at night. They love the Beatles <laughs> because they love their dad. <laughs> And the two go together. <laughs> that I do know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, this is Jim Shaw. We've been talking to Joel Heitkamp, as you know. And if you listen to this station, you certainly know the voice. Uh, I want to read uh, one text. A few have come in, but this one uh, kind of connects with, with you. It says, uh, Joel, I have listened to your show since day one. We are opposite politically most of the time. I'm from your home area. Keep on doing your thing. Really? Yeah. Well, thank you to that. I mean, appreciate it. And thanks for listening. I mean that. Uh, without them, we, we wouldn't be number one. So I appreciate that. All right. I want to go to what I call a, a lightning round, some hard, quick hitting. I want, you know, quick answers. I haven't told you these questions ahead of time. So hopefully we'll, something will hit you right away. So I just want to about your favorites. So let, here we go. Your favorite politician ever. Quentin Burdick. Wow. Interesting. Okay. Favorite movie? Uh, The Big Chill. Interesting again. Favorite television show? Cheers. That's a great one. That's a great one. Favorite comedian? Uh, Rodney Dangerfield. I love Rodney. Good answer. Good answer. All right. I'm regretting asking this question because I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking I know where you might go, but you might go a different direction. Rolling Stones. No, that. Oh, no, no. I wouldn't. I wouldn't give you the airtime for that. Okay. All right. Favorite sports team? Oh, it's the Vikings. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. I was afraid you, you were going saying, to You a, thought I'd say the Yankees. I thought you might say a Yeah, yeah I grew up Empire. Vikings. Just, I can tell you every player. Okay, good. 
favorite athlete of all time? Uh, Alan Page. Hmm. I, he, think about how he beat down certain norms. Yeah. Yeah. And and obviously a very distinguished off the field. Yep. I'd have a couple more. Favorite food. Oh boy. That gets a little harder. Steak. You know, I'd say steak. Steak. Okay. All right. And last one. Favorite holiday. Oh, Christmas. You get you get everybody together, big family. We serve fifty plus for Christmas at our place. Yeah, my answer to that would be Independence Day. Yep. I think Independence Day sets us up for everything else. If there's no Independence Day with with all the freedoms we have, we have nothing. It it's just a reminder of what a what a fantastic country we have. And well, I think your answer is better than mine. It's just that isn't my opinion. Right, right. That's right. <laughs> I and think you're is, right. Again, but... everyone is entitled to their opinion. Right, and you shouldn't be getting death threats over it. <laughs> <laughs> I got a Red Rider BB gun at Christmas once. <laughs> uh, well, now a Christmas story with, is is a great movie. I hope yes. you like that with the gun and you'll shoot your eye out. I did out. though. I, I love did. that. Um, all right, let's go back. Well, I got you for two minutes. Let's go back to politics. Uh, we were talking about Donald Trump, and he's he's got 91 criminal charges against him. Uh, he paid off a porn star. He incited the insurrection on January 6th. He uh, tried to talk Ukraine into uh, doing some underhanded stuff. I could go on and on. My question is, why does none of this matter? Why do the voters not care about this? Because I go back to what I said earlier, which is those voters that are his solid 35 to 38 percent base are individuals who have lived that same life. All right. But he wins. He's ahead by so much. Yeah. There, there there are other candidates in that party. Um, Nikki Haley is the most prominent who just stand for so much better things and don't have his baggage. Yep. And yet they they stick with Trump with all the stuff he's done. Yeah. Why don't they go to the person who 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 for nothing for lack of something else to mention who actually supports Ukraine? Yeah, but Jim, when's the last time you drove through Fargo and saw a Confederate flag? Because it happens you see to him me every a lot, now and then. right? Yeah. The, and those are the ones uh, you know bold enough to to express it publicly. There are a lot of racist people out there. And Donald Trump made it okay to be racist. He started with Barack Obama, uh, yes. and and he made it okay to be racist. And for many of them, it was always there. It, it it was, but he made it okay to be public about it and to say it and to have a person you can vote for that's very open about his racism. And so, you know, I go I go back to my theory, which is he made it okay to be who uh, the the worst amongst us are. I, I'm sorry if that makes some of them mad. I think that there's a lot of good people that voted for Donald Trump. I do. I think that there's people who voted for him that that just couldn't see Hillary as the leader. They thought she would or could be. Um, you know, there there is that 15%. I get, it. To, I get it. Not everybody who votes for Donald Trump is a racist. Right. But if you are a racist, you've got a candidate oh, in Donald Trump. You've found your home. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's he's wrecked the GOP. They may, I mean, look, look at since he's been in there. They lost the Senate. They lost the House. They lost, uh, you know, they've lost a lot since he's been in there. He has not been a political winner. Right. Okay. We're just about out of time. Yes or no? In light of the polls, should Joe Biden drop out of the race? I, I've said publicly I wish Joe Biden would drop out of the race. I think that Donald Trump would. I think 80-year-old men shouldn't be president. But that being said, I'll vote for Joe Biden over Donald Trump. Joel Lightcamp, it's been a pleasure. I this learned was a lot fun. about you. Thanks so much I, I, for doing I'm not this. I'm used to anybody doing this week, so we'll, thank you. We'll do it again. Yeah. Stay tuned, folks. We're going to talk Three Stooges after this break. Bye-bye.